Well, good morning again, everyone. How many, uh, how many of you remember the Energizer Bunny? What was it he says? He just keeps going and going and going and going. You know, I don't know any better description of a godly mother than the one who just keeps going and going and going and going. Isn't there a lot to do, moms? Yeah. A lot to do. You got to do all that, and then you got to wake up dad, too. I mean, it's just so much to do. So many plans, so many expectations for, for any mother. But then there's that godly mother. And she adds on what God has planned for her and what he expects from those gifts that he has given her, those gifts of, of children. I must say it's a bit ironic to be preaching on this subject of motherhood just six days after the Supreme Court leak that got out about a potential ruling that might bring an end, at least at the federal level, to what I consider to be the greatest holocaust we've ever experienced in this nation, where more than 63 million precious preborn babies have literally been slaughtered in the womb since January 1973, and it's some even before that. It's a holocaust that uh, I believe our nation is going to experience severe judgment over before it's all over from a, from a most holy God. But today, in the church, we want to celebrate. We want to celebrate mothers, grandmothers, and you know what? We want to celebrate all women because all of you are so important and bring so much not just to families but to the church itself and so I want to look at a passage today that's not necessarily about mothers but it is but it's also just about uh, godly women and one of the things that that we know that about our mothers is that they are those who have should be celebrated simply for, first of all, giving life, because that's not a given anymore in our nation. So giving life to raise these precious children to adulthood, making those sacrifices, teaching them the way that God intends for them to, to live. And I think, again, perhaps the best one-word description for a godly mother would be selfless. And you know what I'm talking about. And we're going to see that in our passage today. We're going to Take a fresh look at what has been affectionately called the Proverbs 31 woman. Now to do that, I need you to turn in your Bible. Guess where? Man, y'all are so sharp this morning. Proverbs chapter 31. Interestingly, unlike most of the other Proverbs, this one wasn't written by King Solomon. At least we're pretty sure it wasn't. I'll explain that in a moment. It was written by a king, but not King Solomon. Here's what we read in verse 1 of Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel. Now, who in the world is King Lemuel? Anybody know? No, because nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. There's been some guesses. Some, some people have said it's really probably Solomon and just kind of doing a, one of those poetry things. Some people say that it's just some other guys, and some people say it's this, that, and we don't. And basic bottom line, we don't really know. But the Bible says he's a king. His name is Lemuel. So read on with me again in verse one. It says the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. All right. So it's written by King Lemuel, but notice it's the oracle which his mother taught him. Now, what is an oracle? It's, well, let me just give you the definition of an oracle. It's someone who, it's, it's really kind of like a person in, in a lot of ways, but it's someone who has conversations with God. We might think of it a little bit more like a prophet. The NIV probably translates this the best here. It says it's an inspired utterance, you know, after spending time with God. In other words, this, this is a God-inspired 
word from a mother, from God through a mother to her son. And there's a message here. It's not just for him, it's for us as well. So we want to look and see what the message is today. Let's look at, let's read the next few verses, verse 2 through 9. What, O my son, and what, O son of my womb, and what, O son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink, for they will drink and forget what, what they decreed and pervert the rights of all of the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him who, whose life is bitter. But let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of the unfortunate. The uh, New Living Translation here says, verse 8, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. I guess you know who I thought of when I read that. All of those babies that are in the womb that are not being given a chance at life. He says, open your mouth for the mute and give for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth and judge righteously and defend the rights of the afflicted. I want you to know that's great advice from a mother to a son in any generation. Amen? Things to stay away from. Things that you should be involved in. Next, she continues her God-given wisdom by advising her son about the kind of wife, the kind of mother of his children that he should be pursuing. We read this in verses 10 to 12. An excellent wife who can find. How many of you know that this is the, the, the person, whether it's the wife or the husband, the person that you choose to spend your life with is the second most important decision we will ever make. You know that? We all know what the first most important decision is, right? To follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But the second most important decision is that person that we will choose to spend the rest of our, our lives with. This goes on to say, For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. I thought about that last night when I was reading over this one more time. That has to be about the greatest honor anybody could receive. To be absolutely trustworthy that that anyone can trust you in any moment that's a great honor not not something to be taken lightly especially in this day of all the deception and everything to to be a trustworthy person and this mother is telling her son this is the kind of woman that you want to pursue verse 11 goes on to say and he will have no lack of gain she does him good and not evil watch look at that just for a moment in other words, she's not just neutral. It's not that she just doesn't do him evil. She actually makes that effort to do him good. And she does it all the days of her life. You know what this means? It means she finishes well. It means she upholds those marriage vows. You know, better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and in health. She's there to the end, no matter what the situation goes on to say in 13, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's looking for some kind of opportunity to help her helpmeet that God has given her. And her primary focus, of course, is on God, but her next focus is on her family, her husband, her children. Verse 15 says, or verse the rest of verse, no, verse 14, there it is. Uh, she is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. In other words, there's a long way to the food line in that day. But she did whatever it took to bring the food into the house. Verse 15, she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. In other words, she's a giver. She considers a field and she buys it from the earnings she plants in a vineyard. She invests in her future. 
this is the, the energizer part. If you're, if you're not seeing it already, you're seeing how this woman is just, she just never stops, it seems like. And, and so she's investing in the future. She girds herself with strength, and she makes her arms strong. In other words, she prepares herself for success. She doesn't just walk out and say, I hope everything works out well today. She is prepared to go out and, and do these things. She senses that her gain is good and her lamp does not go out at night. Mom, you could tell us better than anybody that in the middle of the night when the kids get sick, they don't usually call for daddy, do they? They call for mommy. Mom is always on call. She's always there. She's always being needed to nurture someone. She stretches out her hands to the, the staff. And her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. In other words, this is a very hands-on person. She's very involved and she's very others-oriented. She is not afraid of the snow for her, for her household, for all of her household are clothed with scarlet. She prepares her household for success. The Holman version here says that her her family is doubly clothed. Doubly clothed. She makes sure they're going to be warm when they go out into the snow. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Now she's been doing something for, for her husband, for her children, for other people. All this time she's been looking out for someone else. But the Bible says here that finally she gets around to herself and she doesn't neglect her own appearance. She's not a shabby woman. In other words, she knows that it's important. She, she clothes herself in linen and purple. That, that's a symbol of being very respectable and, and of good taste. Her husband is known in the gates. This implies that her husband, when in the gates means this is where all the, the city business is done. This is where the people gather around. And, and this is implying that her husband is, he benefits from the achievements of his wife, from the appearance of his wife, from all that his wife does when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. In other words, she's not just about the physical appearance, but she's about the, the spiritual clothing as well. She, this is a woman who has a testimony. And she smiles at the future. This is a woman who is content. She's content with, with what she has. I lost my place. Y'all wonder why I'm pausing. There it is. Okay. She opens her mouth in wisdom. And, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Proverbs 10.31 says, The mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom. The teaching of the kindness is on her tongue. This is the way that she deals with her husband, her children, her friends, even her servants. And she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also praises her. Psalm 27, 2 says, Let another praise you and not your own mouth. Let me just pause here and say something about verse 28. For you moms, this is just, a, just to kind of help you out here, especially if you're raising young children right now. It says her children rise up and bless her. I want you to know something. This might not happen immediately. This might be something down the road. It might take a while for your children to, to rise up and bless you. Let me, let me explain. Look back at verse 15 again. It says, She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household. This might present a problem for some. When I was a young lad, my mom had a job where she left for work about 5 o'clock every morning, or 5.30 every morning. 
And my mom was the kind that was not going to leave the house until her family had been taken totally good care of. And that meant breakfast. Um, the whole deal. Not a piece of toast or a bowl of cereal, but the whole deal every single morning. And so at 4.30 a.m. every morning, I was wakened and brought to the table to sit down and eat a full breakfast at 4.30 a.m. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you something. At 4.30 a.m. in that day, nobody was calling my mom blessed. But this was going to be what she had to do. And as a 12-year-old, I was convinced this was not reasonable. It was not necessary. It wasn't even healthy to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to eat a full breakfast. I mean, a 12-year-old's digestive tract is neither awake nor appreciative at 4.30 a.m. It took me years, moms, to, to come to appreciate my mother's sacrifice enough to call her blessed for her sacrifice all those early mornings, that early morning love, but I eventually did, just like the Bible says. But if it doesn't come right away, just wait for it. It'll come. Look again at verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. This is a woman. You read between the lines here, you'll see a woman who is very content. She is so busy, she is into so many things, but it's not for her. It's always for someone else. This is a woman who's content. How many of you know contentment is a blessing? The Apostle Paul talks about how we, we need to be content with whatever we have, whatever situation we're in. But so much uh, of, of our world today lives in a day-to-day -day routine. They're, they're pursuing this, they're after that, they're going this way and they're going that way, but they never seem to finally be satisfied with what they have. They're always longing for that next material possession. Someone was once asked, one of the wealthiest men in the world, this question, how much money will finally be enough for you? You know what his answer was? Just one more dollar. I mean, you know that never ends. Just one more dollar. One of the wealthiest men in the world. Years ago, I watched a documentary about some natives who lived in one of our, the world's rainforest. The story was focused on one particular native who, who was in the process of cutting down these huge trees. And of course, if you know anything about natives in the rainforest, they had to cut them down by hand. Lots of work, time, and effort went into this. He was cutting down these trees to build a house for his family. What was so interesting was that this was going to be a tree house. And what made it even more interesting was he was attempting to build this tree house in the top of the very tallest tree in that part of the jungle. Now, of course, this was a community effort. Lots of natives were involved. And as I watched all these natives who were almost naked because they practically owned practically nothing, it became very clear that this house in the tallest tree in the jungle would result in this man's finest achievement ever. And when they finally finished the house, what happened next really caught my attention. The owner climbed the tree way up in the, up, way, I mean it was way up in the air, climbed this tree, he went into his house, he built a fire in the house, and then he stepped out on a limb to appreciate his new view of the jungle. And then he spoke, and his words were translated on the screen. You know what he said? I have a fire. I have a view. I am content. And I thought, wow. I have a fire. I have a view. And I am content. This man didn't have a pair of pants. He didn't have a shirt. He had no shoes. He had no nice car. He had no car at all. 
He had practically nothing else, but his family had been provided for, and therefore, he was content. This family would climb to the top of this extremely tall tree every time they returned home, and you know what they would find there? Contentment. They would find contentment there. How many of us can honestly say that? Some of us have trouble climbing out of the bed and finding that kind of contentment, don't we? I mean, maybe the air conditioning is just a little too cool this morning when, we, when our feet hit the floor. Maybe the, the heat set too hot. Maybe the bed was too hard or too soft. And maybe it's raining outside or, or, you know, the water in the shower took two seconds longer than normal to get warm. But this man was content with a fire and a view. He reminds me of this, this energizer woman to watch that documentary and see all the work that went involved. And then at the end, of the, the end of the day, contentment. Look at this woman again in verse 25. She was able to smile at the future because of her faithful activity. For her recipe for contentment, look again at verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of of idleness. In other words, she was properly focused. The Apostle Paul, speaking of the potential for young widows that they might get off on the wrong foot, he gives us a, a passage here in 1 Timothy. It's in your bulletin. 1 Timothy 5, 13 to 15. Again, speaking of young widows. Here's what he says. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house. Not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies and talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want young widows to get married, to bear children, to keep house. How many of you know you do all those kind of things, you're not going to have a lot of time for idleness, are you? He says, I want them to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. And then Paul in another letter offers a contrast when he speaks to older women in a, in a more positive way. In Titus 2, 3 to 5 he says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips nor enslaved to much wine. They are to be with those who are teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to do what? to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. What's the point here? The point here, you see these two passages about those who are running around from house to house, those who are being instructed to just kind of stay home and and take care of the business of the home. The point is simply this. There is much to be done in a godly home. I thought I'd get an amen from a couple of you, my ladies. There's a lot to be done in a godly home. We've just examined a contrast of running here and there and doing this and that. A contrast with focusing on the home. The children that God has blessed us with. Focusing on them. Personally, I've been so blessed in my life by four very special women. My mom, my grandma, my wife, and her mom, who was like a mom to me. And all of them have left a godly impact on my life, and they've left a godly impact on the life of our children. Keep your finger there in Proverbs and, and turn over with me to 1 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 1. I want you to, to notice this passage about Paul speaking about Timothy and his faith. I want you to see where he gives credit for that. Here's what we read in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in, in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, 
My beloved Son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. He's not talking about his blood son here. He's talking about his son in the faith. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience. The way my forefathers did is I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. Why is all that? He says this, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. You see that? Paul credits Timothy's faith first with his grandmother, then with his mother, and then he says, I know it's in you as well. You know, I think it's, it's too bad that we don't celebrate Grandmother's Day in the church. Because grandmas are so special. They're, they're just like moms in that they play such an important role in the lives of our children. Branson, our youngest one, you used to see up here on stage, he's living down at Caswell now, but when I went to our first church where I pastored, I noticed that they didn't have an RA program there, and I grew up in RAs. I just thought RAs was the greatest thing, so we started a, a chapter of RAs in that church, and uh, one of the things that we did with the RAs is we had the RA leaders have those boys memorize Bible verses, and of course they would get badges and different things for for every so many verses that they memorized. Branson actually, he shined in this thing. He ended up with 75 Bible verses that he had uh, memorized. But the reason he was able to do that so well is because one day a week, Donna would drop the littlest kids off with, with her mom while she went around and did all the, the other momly responsibilities, you know, the piano lessons and the doctor's appointments and school lessons and buying groceries and clothes for the family and on and on and on. You know what mothers are all about. But Grandma had Branson for a few hours on that day. And so she got in on the act as well by planting seeds of faith in that young man. And she helped him to memorize all of these Bible verses until he, he had them down pat. And it was just, it was just her way of, of speaking life into her grandchild. And that was such a testimony for me to watch because it just showed me that this is not just about moms. As important as moms are, they're the day in, the day out, the hour by hour ladies. But those grandmoms might not see the kids quite as much, but when you do, oh, what an impact you can have. Next time you see Branson, ask him to spout out some of those verses. Let me know if he still can. I don't know. Really, you know, probably not. But he could at that time. Go back to Proverbs 31 with me again. Back to verse 27. We'll finish up the chapter. Here's what it says. She looks well to the ways of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all charm is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman who fears the lord she shall be praised this is why she does it all she does all she does because she is actually serving the lord by serving her family again i I remember my, my mother. There were certain things about my mother and my grandmother that have stayed in my mind about serving the Lord. I remember every single Sunday morning. Not so that I could see it, but I was just paying attention. My mom would pull out the checkbook and write a check. No matter how... Things were tough for them sometimes growing, when I was growing up. Every Sunday morning she would write that check to the church. And that left an impact on me. Because I knew... God was important in their lives. I remember watching my grandmother. I talked about the RAs. We, uh, the RAs would go over and, 
when she was a, a shut-in, and we would go to the houses of the shut-ins, and we would sing Christmas carols and different things. And I was one of those little RAs, and I watched her sit there with tears running down her face as we sang about her Lord. And that had a lasting impact on me of just how important God was in her life. He goes on to say here, give, give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. In other words, where everyone can see out there in the gates. This is a godly woman. She's an energizer woman. And God has ordained her place and her purpose in which to exert that God-giving energy. And I thank God for the energizer women and godly mothers in my life, and I bet you do too. So why don't you tell her today? You know, I probably shouldn't tell you this because this is extra biblical, and I'm not even sure it works. So don't say the pastor's telling us to do these things. I'll just tell you what. Occasionally, I don't do this often, but occasionally, I just wish I could say something to my mom who's gone home. So you know what I do? I don't pray to my mother. I don't, you know, I don't say things thinking she's hearing me or anything like that. But I do occasionally, once in a while, not much. I'll ask Jesus <laughs> if he'll pass on a word. This might be a good day to do that if you want to do that. I'm not telling you it works. I don't even know. Find out when I get there. But once in a while, I just have something I want her to know. Today it would be how much I appreciate the sacrifice that she put in in raising me and my two sisters. Perhaps the best way to understand God's intent for motherhood would be to remove the M. It's the word otherhood. They're always about somebody else. I mean, that's the definition of a mother. She's about someone else. Where the mission of a godly wife and mother is to pour herself into the gifts of children that God has given her. And I just want to say, I thank you, godly mothers doing that with your children no matter how much trouble we're having in our nation right now we're a better nation than we would have been had it not been for godly mothers and godly grandmothers and godly women let's pray our heavenly father Lord, thank you for godly mothers, for godly grandmothers, and for godly women. Lord, we are much better people because of the women in our lives. I thank you for all the women who take the time to, to listen to you and to gain your instruction and to get into your word and to obey your word and to get their priorities settled and right to know where their mission is to know what the purpose of their life is Lord there's probably not a better earthly picture of Jesus Christ than the sacrificial mother these women who give everything for someone else. We thank you for that picture. We thank you for these ladies. And I pray that they will be especially honored on this day. In Jesus' name.